Take your Bible and keep your Bible out and open. You have no idea where I'm going to go. Uh, even though I put verses up on the screen, um, this, this series of messages that I'm going to teach, I'm going to do more teaching maybe than preaching, uh, but this series probably will save your life. I don't mean that in a way that I'm going to save your life. Because I can't save anybody. But literally, prayer saves people's lives. Prayer is what got you here into God's house this morning. Long ago, when you were out in sin, the Word of God came to you somehow, some way. You opened up your heart. Jody's here. I remember because we invited Al and another guy who was speaking on, he was speaking out against abortion, right? And that was your first time here, wasn't it? Thanks. That's okay. I've, I've stolen just about... Do what? I know. We went to kindergarten together, didn't know each other. But I've stolen just about everything that him and Al came up with. Mine is the talk show Hell Hates. And I, I come to everybody from my top secret broadcasting bunker at Area 52. And um, so anyway, I, I learned a lot from these guys. And I told them, I said, I'm going to steal everything you guys have ever taught me. I'm going to use it. And they said, that's fine. But anyway... Um, Prayer is what got you here. When you were lost in sin, the Word of God came to you. And what did God tell you? What, what did the Word tell you? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who do we confess our sins to? A Catholic priest? Virgin Mary? She don't hear your confession. And I, I read something uh, on my program the other day where the Catholics teach that all the graces necessary for salvation come through Mary. That's a lie. And he's got a tract. I don't know if you've got it with you. He's gone down to Mexico. And there's a tract that Chick Publication puts out called Why is Mary Crying? Or Why is Mary Weeping? And they have it in Spanish. And he goes down there and they eat that up down there. He'll stand right out in front of the Catholic Church and hand out hundreds of those to Roman Catholics who need to hear the gospel. Is that right? Because they have been told that this gives you grace. No, it doesn't. Crying out to God gives you grace. Luke 11, verse 1. And it came to pass that as he, as he was praying in a certain place, what was he doing? What, what was, watch this now. I may not get past this. What was Jesus doing here? The context is, who's the he in verse 1? It's Jesus. What was Jesus doing in this place? Luke 11 verse 1, what does it say? What was he doing there? He was praying. If Jesus prays, and he's the Son of God, don't you think that we should follow in his footsteps and pray. And what place was he in? Was he in church? It doesn't say. So you know what that, when the Bible doesn't tell you something, you know what that means? It's wide open. So in a certain place to us means that there is no place in this world where you cannot pray. Including a public school. Including a public school. You can pray there. They just can't stop you from doing it. They, they may be able to stop you from leading it, but they can't stop you from praying. Nobody, nobody can stop the operation of what goes on in your mind and in your heart. Nobody can. 
that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. That's the theme of where we're going, is that God would teach us to pray. Now, to give you a little information as we turn to Ephesians 6, because this is the core of where we've been, what we've been dealing with uh, for quite a while now, the whole armor of God, learning what all of these parts meant, what they are, what they represent, and you know me, I count things in the Bible, and I'd always counted this list stopping with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But if you notice in verse 17, um, my English teacher in seventh grade taught me how to diagram sentences. Who's ever diagrammed an English sentence before? Try diagramming one of Paul's sentences. Paul has sentences that go six to eight verses in the Bible. How many nouns, pronouns, adverbs, predicate nominatives are in the, those verses? Anyway, the verse doesn't stop. The thought doesn't stop at verse 17. There's a colon there. It keeps going. Praying always is included with the spiritual warfare. If you don't pray, devils will eat you alive. If you don't pray. Okay? And that's biblical. I can read to you. In fact, I would tell you, read the entire book of Psalms and then tell me about what it, what it requires to get your enemies off your back. When you read 150 of those Psalms, you'll find out that crying out to God gets them off your back. God, get, get the enemies off of me. I can't take it no more. Let me tell you what brought me to this. I mentioned this morning that there's, there's one book that you should follow. And I still stand behind that. However, God does use teachers. There's no doubt about that, as long as they stick with the Word of God. My testimony years ago was, if I got books on Bible prophecy, I would spend all the time reading what the author said and skip the Scriptures. I thought, I already know the Scriptures. I want to see what the guy says. When God put me into this ministry in 1997, and that's really how I ended up knowing these guys. When God brought me into this in 1997, what God did with me was change me. Mike, we're not going to read a bunch of books. You're going to read mine. And you only think you know what I said. You're going to know what I said. By the time I'm done with you, you're going to know what I said and what I didn't say. So God led me and taught me to follow scripture. So if I get a book in my hand on whatever subject, first thing I do is I look at number one, what Bible they're using. And if it ain't King James, I'm more than likely, I'll just set it aside. Because I ain't got time to read it, number one. Number two, I don't trust any other Bible except this one. This one is the Word of God. This is what we believe in. It's what we stand on. This is what we believe. This is what we preach. This is it right here. And there's no confusion here. Everybody in here has got a King James Bible. If you don't have one, there's one in the pew. And if you, don't, if you can't find one in the pew, we'll get you one. Amen? We love giving away Bibles here. So anyway, one day, <clears throat> I was in a mess. I was sitting at my desk. And I, I'm kidding you, I was I was a mess. And it was a situation in life, I, I'm not going to talk about publicly, um, but Rose had set some books on my desk that one of her relatives, she's only got 50,000 down in, and they all live in Fredericktown. It's a Fredericktown girl back there. And one of her relatives died and left her all of her religious books. Rose brought them to me and set them on my desk. She said, go through them. If you want to keep any of them, fine. If not, just throw the rest away. I don't want them. And that sat on my desk for, what, eight months, something like that. But it was a situation where God was going to teach me to trust him. And I had been in the ministry. I'd been here in the ministry for several years. At least ten that I can remember. And God was going to force me to trust Him. 
and he was going to teach me how to do it. So I'm sitting there in my, in my chair and I'm sold up. I'm, I'm upset. I'm mad at God, mad at myself, and I don't want to do anything. Well, I thought, well, I got to get my mind off this. So I look and there's that stack of books there. And I, so I thought, well, I'll do this for Rose. I'll get that out of my way after eight months. Don't ask me, Pastor, did you read my email? When was that? First book, I'm not kidding you, first book on the top was a book by John R. Rice called Prayer, Asking and Receiving. Tim, have you read that book? And the first thing I did was, I knew John R. Rice. I knew the name and I knew I could probably count on this to be fundamental. So I picked it up and I started looking at the scriptures. And the first chapter got me. Let me show you what he has in the first chapter of that book. Um, Psalm 65, verse 1. Praise waited for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the, shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. What did David call God in verse 2 of Psalm 65? O thou that hearest prayer. Who is your God to you? He is the God that does one thing well for you. And that is hear your prayer. If you don't grasp anything else that I say after this, you grab a hold of that and hang on to that for your dear life. Because it will save you. If you believe, if, if, if those sweet Roman Catholics in Mexico, who that's all they've been taught, was to pray to this statue, if they can pray to a statue that is deaf and dumb and blind and cannot save them, why is it that we can't pray to the God who can hear us, who can talk back to us, who can see us, and who can save us. Amen. He is the God. And when I read that, God got me. He said, now Mike, start reading. And what I think that book is, I think it's someone transcripted messages that John R. Rice preached on, on prayer. Because it looks like he's preaching a message. Because, you know, us preachers, we get dumbfounded sometimes and we repeat ourselves and we repeat ourselves and then we repeat ourselves. And that's what it looks like in there. So I'm, I'm reading what he said and then I'm looking at the scriptures and the scriptures are grabbing hold of me. And Tim, I got scared being, I lived out in Oklahoma for three years in Oral Roberts territory. And I got scared out there of the charismatic way. I got scared to ask God for things. I got scared to pray. I was afraid to believe that God would always hear me when I prayed and would answer me in the positive. Every time I prayed. I told you to hold your Bible open. Turn to John. I, have to, I feel like I have to back up everything I say on this with Scripture. Now... Had I grabbed that book and it would have said Prayer by Joyce Myers, I would have went. Pfft. That witch knows nothing about prayer. But I was looking at the Word of God and the Word of God grabbed my attention. And from that point forward, God began to teach me that, Mike, you can ask me anything that you want and I will never tell you no now I may not give you exactly what you ask for but if I don't I will give you better than what you ask for because sometimes Mike you don't even know what to ask me for and that's true I don't even know what to pray that's biblical that's down the list 
of things I'm going to teach you. But John chapter 15. What does John chapter 15 say? Verse 6. No, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same might bring forth much fruit, possibly, maybe. Is that what it says? No, it's in the affirmative. The same bringeth forth much fruit. It's an absolute. For without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, both of them together. Both of them have to be together. That's the clause of this. And what scared me, what the charismatic scared me out of was, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. And I was afraid to pray that. Because I was surrounded by crazy charismatics who went around claiming, I claim this in Jesus' name. That's mine now. I claim it. And they went around claiming everything that wasn't theirs. They went around naming this and claiming that. And they were taught that their words would just settle every problem. And it's not that way. I go to God. I don't cry out to the world. I go to the one who actually hears my prayer. And that God said to me, Mike, if ye will abide in me and my words abide in you, then ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe God or not? Now, Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because I guarantee you every day he's thinking how he's going to outfox you. Outwile you. He woke me up. Somebody woke me up six o'clock this morning. And the devil was there trying to scare me right off the bat. And the Holy Spirit was there to get him out of the way. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, you're having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Verse 18. Now look at what it says. Praying, how often? With Number one, always, that means all times. Number two, with all prayer. Number three, and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with how much perseverance? All perseverance and supplication for how many saints? Tim, the Catholics pray to the saints. But Jesus told us to pray for the saints. I like Jesus better than that. Amen? Let's pray. We haven't prayed yet. Father, I need your help to preach this. I need your help to teach it. Father, my mind is in a million places this morning. I pray, God, that I would follow my notes or I'll follow you. One of the two, but I'm going to stick to the Word of God this morning. Father, I thank you, Lord. I cannot give these people what I do not have. And Father, I could not teach this 20 years ago. But you've taught me to pray. You've taught me to ask. And it shall be given. You've taught me that if I seek, I shall find. You, have, you told me that if I knocked, that it shall be opened unto me. And Father, I thank you, God, for teaching me how to pray, how to ask, how to stop what I'm doing and just talk to you for a while. To get things off my mind, to get things out of my heart, to have somebody, God, that will listen to me. You are a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. And you've listened to everything I've ever had to say. And I thank you, Jesus, for being my friend. 
to hear me when I prayed. And to understand that when I got mad, I wasn't going to stay mad. You were going to help me and you were going to have mercy on me. And you were always going to be kind to me. You were going to be better to me than my parents were, than my grandparents were. You were going to be better to me than anybody in this world could ever be to me. And that you would never tell me no. So Father, teach us to pray. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. See, you got to pray before you preach. Amen. And I've mentioned that a while ago. We come here to sing. We come here to see one another, fellowship one another, love one another, greet one another, shake hands, give each other sicknesses and diseases, pass them back and forth, come back after we're all done, do it again. We come here to preach, come here to hear the Word of God taught. But Jesus said, my house, number one, if it's anything, it is a house of prayer for all people. See, some religions won't even let you in the door because you're not up to their level. Jesus said, bring them all in and I'll hear their prayer. Ask yourself in the question, ask yourself this question, who in the Bible did God hear their prayer? How wicked were people, some of the people that prayed? My mind went immediately. I was trying to think of the first person in the Bible to pray. And it's kind of hard to, to track down. You see Abram talking to God in Genesis chapter 16. But not too long after that, after Ishmael is born, you have Hagar who has been cast out. And she's in the wilderness and she cries out to God. And some people will say, God doesn't hear the prayer of the sinner. If that's the case, no one of us would have ever gotten saved. Hagar was not even God's choice. And yet he heard her cry out to him in the wilderness and he opened her eyes and showed her there was a well of water that she could draw from. So if God can hear her prayer, will he not hear yours? I've mentioned this before. We have someone in the Bible mentioned to us who is the chief of sinners. Paul said that Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. If Paul then is the chief of sinners, who are you? You're second class compared to him. As far as sinners go. And if God would hear the prayer of Saul of Tarsus, he would hear your prayer. Do you believe that? Say amen. Psalm 102. Turn your Bible there. Psalm 102. We're going to learn some things. I've got three things to teach you today before I let you out of here. And you've got to learn all three of them before we go. Psalm 102, verse 1. Now, verse 1. What does it say? Hear my prayer, O Lord. That in itself is a prayer. Hear my prayer, O Lord. And let my, my what? My cry come unto thee. How many of you cry when you pray? Nothing wrong with that. Now let me ask you this question. Does every prayer have to be spoken with your mouth? Obviously not. Paul said praying always. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And even at times when our mouth cannot speak, God hears us in our spirit. Do you believe that? Tim, in 2006, April 1st, April Fool's Day, I got electrocuted almost to death. The, elect, the electrical charge grabbed a hold of me and held me. And I was about, I knew I was not breathing. And as I was ready, I knew right then that I was going to die. I knew it. I said, Mike, this is, you're fixing to go stand before God right now. I didn't feel any pain. 
But I wasn't breathing, and I knew it. I didn't know then what that kind of electrical charge would do to your heart. But it could have stopped my heart. And I would have died right then. That's how they kill hogs in a slaughterhouse, by the way. Electrocution. They run volts of electricity through them, and it stops their heart, which is a pretty painless way of dying. I would have died without any pain, but I would have died. And in my spirit, because I couldn't speak, my heart said, I'm not ready to leave my wife and my children. And instantly, it let go. And I'm still alive today. So just because you don't pray with your mouth doesn't mean you cannot pray. God still hears it. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. And write some of these things down. Pray when you're in trouble. Ask God not to hide his face from you. In the day when I call, answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke. My bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. This is how I felt when I had COVID. By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. You're crying out to God because you realize no one else can help you. No one else can save you. No one else can fix your problems. No one else can forgive your sins. No one else can heal your body. No one else can do it except God, the one God who hears prayers. And then he says in verse 17, you might want to write this down too. God will regard, he will regard the prayer of who? The destitute. Destitute is somebody who has gotten to the end of the rope and has nowhere else to go. Destitute is a homeless person who's run out of getting money from everybody else in the world. They have no place to go. They have no place to live. Their body's craving drugs and alcohol and they can't stand it. That's destitute. God's waiting to hear people who are destitute. Tim would go, I hate to keep talking about this guy, but I like him. He would go into gay bars in Las Vegas. Sodomite houses. There's a video that he has that was made about suicide. And he would ask the bartender, because the bartender knows the gay guys in the bar. Can I... Uh, do you have people in here that are afraid of suicide or worry about suicide? And the bartender said, everybody's sitting in here. Tim says, can I hand them a free DVD that'll help them with suicide? Bartender said, knock yourself out. And God just opened a door for this man to go in and hand them a gospel tract. The most lost people in the world, when they are destitute and they cry out to God, God will hear their prayer. A young man was brought to me one time from a lady who used to go to this church. Her brother was a young man. He was in his 20s, Tim, and he had AIDS and was dying. She asked him, she said, can I bring my preacher to talk to you about going to heaven because you're going to die? And he said, yes. And I, I went to the hospital, St. John's Mercy. I went to the hospital and I said, look, I'm not going to play games. I already know who you are. And I know that you're a sinner like I was. And I said, I'm going to read you some verses of Scripture. And I'm going to ask you, do you believe that? So I read him John 3.16. I wrote him, read him Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, 1 John 1.9. 1, I said, do you believe that if you ask God to forgive you of all your sins, that God will forgive you of all your sins and give you everlasting life in heaven? And he... He, the AIDS had worked on his brain to the point where he couldn't finish sentences. But he said yes. And I said, I want to help you pray this prayer. You, only you can pray this. I cannot pray it for you. You must pray it. He prayed the sinner's prayer. And I said, do you believe Jesus in your heart right now? And he said yes. He's bawling his eyes out. 
I said, do you believe God has forgiven you of all your sins? He said, yes. I went to visit him on his deathbed before he died. And I said, I said, are you sure you're going to heaven? He said, he knew, he was still, he knew God had forgiven him of his sins. His two sodomite buddies came over to me. We're so glad. They thought I was some liberal. And I said, hold on, guys. Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to be mean. I said, but he asked me to come and visit him because he knew that the lifestyle that he lived with you guys was sinful in the eyes of God and he asked God to forgive him. <laughs> Boy, that shut him up. We held his funeral right here. I believe I'll see him in heaven. If God will hear the prayer of that destitute young sodomite, will he hear yours? He will regard, he will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generation to come. Guess what? You're reading it. It was. This shall be written for the generation to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. David said this 3,000 years ago, and it's still true today. God hears the prayer of the destitute. Somebody say amen. Whew. Who are you that God will not hear your prayer? How, how wrong have you been? How sinful have you been? How sinful do you have to become before God will not hear your prayer? God will hear the prayer of the one who says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Which is exactly what I prayed while I was being electrocuted. I knew I was going to stand before God. And I remember Lee Walsh. The night he died, prayed the same thing. He said, I just wanted to make sure. Bob Fiedler, you remember him? Sat right on that second row. The day he died, he died on the operating table. That operated on his heart. The day he died, he just broke through us talking and said, I just want everybody to know in case anything happens to me, I'm going to heaven today. That man knew it because God heard his prayer. He knew it. Turn to Psalm 65. We read that a while ago. I introduced you to the God. And there is only one God. There is only one God. There are no monks and nuns and priests and saints and statues that can hear your prayer. There are no statues that can answer your prayer. There are no, why is it that a statue with legs has to be carried around? Why is it that a statue with arms cannot reach down and touch you and save you? They have eyes. David said it in the Psalms. They have eyes they cannot see. They have ears they cannot hear. They have mouth they cannot speak. There is only one God that can hear your prayer. You know Him. Why don't you pray to Him? O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Now you stop and think about this for a moment. When we pulled out of the driveway this morning, we chased 14 squirrels out of the way. What were they doing? They were climbing trees. What were they climbing trees for? What's up in there? Acorns. Who put them there? Does not God feed all the squirrels? Does not God feed all the fish in the sea? Does not God feed all the sheep out in the field? Does not God feed all the deer that we kill every November? I remember that you hit one coming to work one morning, didn't you? Does not God feed all the deer and all the fish and all the birds and all the squirrels and all the things that He didn't really create? He didn't really put his breath in them the way he did us? Careth God for squirrels? If God can care enough to... Look at that verse. Unto thee shall all flesh come. 
Every living creature on this planet, both plant and animal, is fed somehow, some way by God. And you think God's going to forget you who were created in His image? Not a chance. Not a chance. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Are you learning something? Now, just so you'll know, I'm not copying notes out of that book I told you about. I'm not. Okay? I sat yesterday and I spent hours. You know me. I'm always afraid I'm going to run out of scripture before one o'clock. So I have enough to keep us till one o'clock. But I'm not going to keep you till one o'clock. Look at it. I had people look up and go. I'm not going to keep you till one. We're almost done this morning. Romans 8, verse 26. What does your Bible say? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our what? What are infirmities according to the Bible? If you were to look up the, the word infirmity or infirmities in the King James Bible, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find sicknesses, you're going to find disease, and you'll also find sin. What, did, what does the book of Hebrews say about the priest, the Levite priest of the Old Testament that they had? They had infirmities. You know what the Levite priest had to do before he offered a sacrifice for the people who brought the sacrifice? He had to offer a sacrifice for himself first because he also was a sinner like they were. But Christ came who did not have to offer a sacrifice for himself because he was sinless offered himself once and for all, for all of our sins. Hallelujah! Somebody say amen. So, all of us, all of us in this church, all of you listening to me, every one of you are sinners. Hell-deserving, wicked by nature, by default, you are sinners. You were shapen in iniquity and Fastened or uh, fashioned in corruption, the Bible says. You were born to sin. It's a craving in your flesh that cannot be denied. And these poor Roman Catholic priests and nuns are told that God will give them a special sanction and will take away their lust if they become a Catholic priest and vow a vow of celibacy, that they'll never lust another day in their life. Charles Chinnickley wrote a book called The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional. And he said as a young boy, he saw the parish priest in his town emasculate himself because he was sick and tired of the lust that he had because he was told by his church that he would never lust again. And he lay in the street bleeding to death because he did that to himself because he didn't want to lust anymore because he was lied to. If he would have just found what Martin Luther found. That the righteousness of God is not the righteousness that we attain to. It is the righteousness that God imputes to us by grace through faith and nothing else. So who does the Spirit help? The good people or the sinners? The ones with infirmities. The ones who are addicted to alcohol, the ones who are addicted to drugs, the ones who are addicted to porn, the ones who are addicted to, to pride, the ones who are addicted to greed. God helps people who have infirmities like me. For we know not that what we should pray for as we ought. Courtney, how old is Elena now? Almost 14 months. Is she the smartest uh, person in the room today? In your house, who's the, who's the adult in your house is what I'm getting to. You and Todd. Can she talk yet? A little bit. Not enough to say, Mommy, can you tie my shoes correctly? That's what I'm getting at. Who's the adult in the room between you and Elena? It's you. Who is it? That when she cries, knows what she needs more than she does. See what I'm getting at? Between us and God, who's the adult in the room? What makes us think that we know more about what we need than the adult does? Our father. 
All we are are babbling children to God and God yet understands our babbling and knows what we need more than we know what we need. See, when we're that young, 14 months, all we know is we need. But we don't know what. We can't, t we can't say it. We can't talk about it. We don't know how to address it. I asked a while ago, who's got a prayer request? And every hand, practically every hand in this building was raised. And I guarantee you, if I were to ask you to stand and tell me what it was publicly, you wouldn't do it. Nor would I make you do it. Because there's some things you can only tell one person in this universe. And that's God. One person. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. That means in our place. That's how you can pray always. With the help of the Holy Spirit. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, I don't want to get into some argument about tongues. But I'm going to tell you, if God said they cannot be uttered, it doesn't mean they're uttered some other way. It means they cannot be uttered. Only Jesus can talk to the Father. Have you pondered that? What happened to the people of Israel when God spoke to them from Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20? What happened? <laughs> They said, stop! Moses, from now on, you go to God, let him talk to you, you come tell us what he said. Right then, God was establishing the office of the mediator, which Christ now permanently fulfills. Only Christ can talk to the Father. Therefore, if you pray, you must pray through the Spirit this, which is the Spirit of God's Son, which crieth, Abba, Father. What does that word Abba mean? Is that a 70s disco group? What does it mean, Gary? Daddy. Because Elena can say, Mama, Dada, right? The first words that any child ever learns to say are the simplest syllables, Mama, Papa, Dada, and in Hebrew, Abba. This is the one who birthed you. This is the one who brought you into this world. God did. You were born again. You are His child. Do you think He's not going to hear you? If the Spirit is in you, He's going to hear you with things that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. The saints don't make intercession for you. St. Peter and St. Paul and St. Mary are not up in heaven praying for us. Now, I pray for you. You pray for me. It does mean that. But Jesus himself is the mediator between us and God who never stops praying on our behalf. See, that's the purpose. See, Moses died. Moses can't be the mediator anymore. Joshua died. He can't be the mediator anymore. Samuel died. David died. Solomon died. Jesus died, but he got over it. And now he stands at the right hand of the Father and he never stops speaking on your behalf before his Father God. Somebody say amen. If you don't think he'll listen to you, do you think he'll listen to his son Jesus? And we know, verse 28, look at, how, look at what this is attached to in your Bible. Say this out loud with me. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to His purpose. So again, who's the adult in the room between you and God? It's always God. Who always knows better than you what's better for you? It's always God, it's never you. So in that context, if I say to you, as a child of God, if you are in Christ and Christ is abiding in you, when God looks at you, who does he see? He sees his son, Jesus Christ, because you are in him. All of the promises 
of this book, Psalm 1, Blessed is the man uh, who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his mind is on the law of the Lord, and his, in his law doth he meditate day and night. That is not me. That is Christ. And only Christ has accomplished that. I've never accomplished that. So in that sense, if I am in Christ, and Christ is abiding in me, when God sees me and he hears me, who does he hear? His son, Jesus Christ. And he's never told Jesus no. Never. When Paul asked God three times to remove the thorn in his flesh, what did God say? Did he say no? No. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul understood that God was giving him something better. Paul said, God removed the thorn. God said, I'll give you something better than removing the thorn. I'll leave the thorn in. I'll give you grace. And it'll sustain you. And it'll hold you until you're with me. Because I'll never let go of you, Paul. And Paul said, fine. Because I'd rather in my weakness God be strong than for me to be strong and God weak. To them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. Not everything that happens to you is good. But this plus what God is going to do after that will work together. To, if I have... You remember math from third grade? If I have two apples and you take away one and then somebody gives me three, how many do I have? Three. See, I lost. I, and Trish, bless your heart, everybody else was going. If I have two apples and you take away one and somebody gives me three, how many do I have? Four. Four. It's four. I was wrong. <laughs> Somebody taking away my apple was bad. But all things work together plus to the good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his, to his purpose. It's like writing a check out of your checkbook. You write a check for $50, but you get paid $100. Now you're to the good $50. Are you still good? You still have $50. That's what he means by that. God will never, ever, ever deny you, ever, a blessing. Will he? Unless you're not saved. If you're not born again, you're going to receive the curse of all curses. It's called the lake of fire. And it burns forever and ever and ever. And you'll suffer forever and ever and ever. But if you're born again, you are a son of the living God. And does the son, when his son asks his father for a fish, will the father give him a scorpion? No. Give him a fish or something better. Your father will never deny you. Three things we've learned today. Number one, write this down. God teaches us that we should pray always. In every situation, good or bad, for ourselves and for others. Number one. That includes, Paul, Paul included himself. He said, pray for me. Now, I don't ask that often enough, I don't think. But I wouldn't be here today if people weren't praying for me. I wouldn't be here. So I ask that you pray for me. The responsibilities that I have, that God has given to us in this church, are great. They're huge. God says he wouldn't have given them to us if he wasn't going to bless us to handle them. Okay? And listen, 
Tim knows this. He was in the worst city in America as far as sin is concerned. And he was a target every day for the devil. Handing out gospel tracts to sinful people. You don't think this guy got a beating from the devil? You don't think he's a sinner like everybody else is? Why do you think he gives the tracts out? He knows sinners. Number two, God teaches us that he has always been known as the God that hears prayer. He's always been that way. He is now and he will never change. Number three, God teaches us that he, the Holy Spirit, helps us to pray that we do not know what to pray. Do not listen to Joyce Myers ever. Ever. She is a lying witch who tells you that she is rich because she deserves it. It's what she said in an interview on Channel 5 after the Post-Dispatch buried her in an article in 2004. She was trying to cover her tracks on her wealth and she said, I am wealthy because I deserve to be because I do what God tells me to do. She is a lying witch. Do not believe her. She will tell you that you cannot get from God unless you ask God specifically what you want. Name it by name. Tell God how to do it. That's baloney. The Holy Spirit helps us to pray that we do not know what to pray, how to ask because of sin and the flesh. And a secondary thought to this is name someone in the Bible that read a prayer to God. Have you... Pam, have you ever been in church service where they read prayers? Name me somebody in the Bible who took out a prayer book and read a prayer to God. Zero. Nobody ever did. You know the prayers that God answered? The ones where people said, God help! And God knew exactly what to do. What a miracle that was. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads. I'm going to ask you to pray. And whether you do it in your pew. You see, I, I don't... You guys know me. I don't think the altar is the only place in the world that you can pray a prayer. You sit right there in that pew if you want to. It is not about showing in the flesh what you did. It's about you crying out to God. And you can do that right where you are. And you don't have to say it out loud either. You can, you can cry it from your heart. You can scream it from your heart right now. God, please hear me. God, please hear me. You can do that right now. There are people watching us online who are sitting in their living room. Do you think I'm going to make them come to the altar to pray? No, they're going to sit where they are right now in their computer chair, in their living room chair, in their truck. And they're going to pray right now for the things they need. And trust God. That he will hear you. He will answer you. In his time. That's next Sunday. Father we come before you right now. God there's so much. In this Bible on prayer. I, I know God. I, my nature is. I want to get it all out. I want, to, I want to clean the bone off completely. And tell him everything there is on prayer. And God I, I can't do it. In a lifetime, I couldn't do it. It's all through your word, but it's so simple. You just taught me to ask you. Just ask. God, help me. God, help me. God, I don't even know what to ask you to help me with. But some, you know something's not right. And God, you know more about what it is than I do. So God, help me. 
or father those who know specific issues. They know the issues because they're part of the issue. They know it. They know what they did wrong. They know what sins they committed. And they know they can't hide them from you. So God, as they cry to you, would you answer them? And Father, in the absence of showing us exactly what you're going to do, maybe you could do with us what you did with Gideon. Maybe you could show us the fleece. Show us the sign. Give us a token, Father, that you are going to answer our prayer. You're going to hear us. You've already heard us. The answer is coming. The blessing is coming. The riches, the glory, the promises are going to be fulfilled. But you're going to do it in your time. At least, Father, give us a token. Like the, like the bow in the cloud in the day of rain. A sign that you will never, ever break your covenant. And you'll never break your promise. So, Father, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray always. Teach us, Father, to, when we're thinking and we're worried about problems, to stop what we're doing and talk to you about them. And call upon you and ask you for help. Instead of worrying and waiting that we can just call upon you anytime, anywhere, any place, eyes open, eyes closed, we can talk to you anywhere. And you'll hear us because you're the one who hears our prayer. Thank you for hearing us today. Thank you for loving us. Thank us Thank you for letting us be your children. And we know, Father, that all things will work together for good. Bless us, Father, and dismiss us in your care, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, would you stand, please?